Hey guys, Kenny here. So today we're going to go ahead and finish up our unit looking at fossil fuels, nuclear energy, our, our non-renewable resources by going ahead and taking a look at nuclear energy. Okay, now this is a little bit different from what we've seen in terms of the other fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas. So today we're really going to be focusing on how we produce nuclear energy and the risks uh, that are associated with the projects. So let's go ahead and jump right into the essential questions. Number one, what is the difference between fission and fusion? Now these terms often get confused. You may have gone over them in an earth science class, uh, maybe even in middle school, but understanding the difference between the two is valuable to understand the nuclear process and how we can get energy from it and why reactions that we do here on earth are different from what those, those that go on on the sun. Number two, what are the advantages of nuclear energy? And on the flip side, number three, what are the disadvantages of nuclear energy? And lastly, we'll go ahead and take a look at what does recovery from fallout look like? So if you have a nuclear accident and we do have radiation fallout, what do we do when we come back from that? Or how does that look? All right, let's go ahead and get started. So let's start with fission versus fusion. These are two really important vocabulary words to understand nuclear reactions. The foundation of nuclear energy is with harnessing the power of atoms. Both fission and fusion are nuclear processes by which we alter atoms to create energy. But what's the difference between the two? At its simplest, fission is the division of one atom into two, whereas fusion is combining two lighter atoms into one bigger one. So fission is breaking apart, fusion is combining, okay? Again, in fusion, we're combining smaller atoms into bigger atoms. In fission, we're breaking bigger atoms into smaller atoms. So let's go ahead and take a look at the process of radioactivity. All of us are continuously exposed to radiation from both natural and man-made sources. The word radiation has many meanings, and there are many types of radiation. Television and radio waves, radar and visible light are all examples of radiation, and none of these cause harm to living organisms under normal conditions. These lower energy types of radiation are called non-ionizing radiation. The other general category of radiation is called ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation is higher in energy than non-ionizing radiation and can damage living cells. It comes from radioactive materials, including naturally occurring radioactive elements found on Earth, cosmic rays from space and man-made radiation sources such as medical x-rays. The level of radiation from naturally occurring sources to which we are exposed on a daily basis is called background radiation, and it varies throughout the world depending on such factors as altitude, soil conditions, and location on Earth. There are four main types of ionizing radiation, alpha particles, beta particles, gamma rays, and neutrons. Alpha particles may be ejected from the nucleus of an atom during radioactive decay. They are relatively heavy and only travel about an inch in air. Alpha particles can easily be shielded by a single sheet of paper and cannot penetrate the outer dead layer of skin, so they pose no danger when their source is outside the human body. Beta particles are essentially electrons emitted from the nucleus of a radioactive atom. They are lighter than alpha particles and can travel farther in air, up to several yards. Very energetic beta particles can penetrate up to one half an inch through skin and into the body. They can be shielded with less than an inch of material such as plastic. In the case of lower energy beta particles, the outer layer of clothing can act as an effective shield. Gamma rays can be emitted from the nucleus of an atom during radioactive decay. They are able to travel tens of yards or more in air and can easily penetrate the human body. Shielding this very penetrating type of ionizing radiation requires thick, dense material such as several inches of lead or concrete. Neutrons can be released from the nucleus of an atom during a fission reaction, such as within a nuclear reactor or upon detonation of a nuclear weapon. Neutrons, like gamma rays, are very penetrating and several feet of concrete is needed to shield against them. 
If radioactive materials are released into the environment as the result of a terrorist attack or accident, people could be exposed to higher than background levels of ionizing radiation that could contaminate them and their surroundings. When vaporized radioactive material is released into the atmosphere, it cools, condenses into solid particles, and falls back to Earth. These particles can be carried by the wind as a plume and can contaminate surfaces far from the explosion itself, including food and water supplies. This phenomenon is known as fallout. When a person is near a source of radiation, some type of radioactive material, he or she can be exposed to the radiation emitted by this source. However, he or she does not become contaminated. One way to think about exposure is to think about x-rays. When a person has a chest x-ray, he or she is exposed to radiation, but does not become contaminated with radioactive material. A person can reduce his or her exposure to radiation if he or she is shielded in some ways from the radiation. For example, if the person is behind a concrete wall or if the radioactive source is inside of a lead container. In order to become contaminated, radioactive material must get on the skin or clothing or inside the body. For example, if radioactive material is incorporated into a dirty bomb, a conventional explosive such as dynamite that has been laced with radioactive material, then people could become contaminated when the device is detonated. Radioactive material on the outside of the body is called external contamination. When a person becomes externally contaminated, simply removing the clothing can remove up to 90% of the contamination. Gently washing the skin and the hair can remove most of the remaining contamination. If a person ingests or inhales radioactive material, it can become incorporated in the organs of the body. This is called internal contamination. When a person is internally contaminated, depending on the type of radioactive material with which they were contaminated, certain medications can be administered to speed up the rate at which the radioactive material is eliminated from the body. For example, Prussian blue is an effective drug that can be used to eliminate cesium from the body and was used on animals following the Chernobyl incident so the population could drink animal milk and eat meat. Potassium iodine tablets were also taken by many people to counter the negative effects of the iodine-131 gas that was released during the accident. Once released, radioactive materials remain a threat to the environment for varying periods of time. The long half-life of some radioactive elements, such as cesium, presents difficult challenges since people may be exposed to a contaminated environment for many years unless action is taken to decontaminate the area affected by the accident. Okay, so as we go ahead and take a look at this, okay, we're thinking about the exposure of contamination and the things that they're talking about could include anything from a nuclear reactor meltdown to you know, nuclear attack to laced with nuclear uh, dirty bombs, these types of things. So the treatment and fallout potentially could be similar. So when we're taking a look at these things, this was from the Environmental Protection Agency. And so it's a pretty reliable source giving you some background on the two main types of radiation. Now, again, non-ionizing radiation is stuff that we deal with every day. Okay? Your cell phone runs on non-ionizing radiation. Those are microwaves. When you listen to a radio station or use the remote control for your TV, this is looking at radio waves and, and these things, all are non-ionizing radiation. The ionizing, ionizing radiation is what we're concerned with, and these are the ones that are like x-rays, okay? uh, being exposed to gamma rays, these types of things. These are the ones that can cause mutations and cause damage to the skin. All right, so I have some other videos included in this. First one is going to be right here, going over the basics of what nuclear energy is. And then we'll look at later on the advantages and disadvantages of nuclear energy. So let's go ahead and start here, and then we'll go ahead and pick up after that. Have you ever been in an argument about nuclear power? We have, and we found it frustrating and confusing. So let's try and get to grips with this topic.
It all started in the 1940s. After the shock and horror of the war and the use of the atomic bomb, nuclear energy promised to be a peaceful spin-off of the new technology, helping the world get back on its feet. Everyone's imagination was running wild. Would electricity become free? Could nuclear power help settle the Antarctic? Would there be nuclear-powered cars, planes, or houses? It seemed that this was just a few years of hard work away. One thing was certain, the future was atomic. Just a few years later, there was a sort of atomic age hangover. As it turned out, nuclear power was very complicated and very expensive. Turning physics into engineering was easy on paper, but hard in real life. Also, private companies thought that nuclear power was much too risky as an investment. Most of them would much rather stick with gas, coal and oil. But there were many people who didn't just want to abandon the promise of the atomic age. An exciting new technology, the prospect of enormously cheap electricity, the prospect of being independent of oil and gas imports, and in some cases, a secret desire to possess atomic weapons provided a strong motivation to keep going. Nuclear power's finest hour finally came in the early 1970s, when war in the Middle East caused oil prices to skyrocket worldwide. Now, commercial interest and investment picked up at a dazzling pace. More than half of all the nuclear reactors in the world were built between 1970 and 1985. But which type of reactor to build, given how many different types there were to choose from? A surprising underdog candidate won the day, the light water reactor. It wasn't very innovative, and it wasn't too popular with scientists, but it had some decisive advantages. It was there, it worked, and it wasn't terribly expensive. So, what does a light water reactor do? Well, the basic principle is shockingly simple. It heats up water using an artificial chain reaction. Nuclear fission releases several million times more energy than any chemical reaction could. Really heavy elements on the brink of stability, like uranium-235, get bombarded with neutrons. The neutron is absorbed, but the result is unstable. Most of the time, it immediately splits into fast-moving, lighter elements, some additional free neutrons, and energy in the form of radiation. The radiation heats the surrounding water, while the neutrons repeat the process with other atoms, releasing more neutrons and radiation in a closely controlled chain reaction. Very different from the fast, destructive runaway reaction in an atomic bomb. In our light water reactor, a moderator is needed to control the neutron's energy. Simple, ordinary water does the job, which is very practical since water is used to drive the turbines anyway. The light water reactor became prevalent because it's simple and cheap. However, it's neither the safest, most efficient, nor technically elegant nuclear reactor. The renewed nuclear hype lasted barely a decade, though. In 1979, the Three Mile Island nuclear plant in Pennsylvania barely escaped a catastrophe when its core melted. In 1986, the Chernobyl catastrophe directly threatened Central Europe with a radioactive cloud, and in 2011, the drawn-out Fukushima disaster sparked new discussions and concerns. While in the 1980s, 218 new nuclear power reactors went live, their number and nuclear's global share of electricity production has stagnated since the end of the 80s. So what's the situation today? Today, nuclear energy meets around 10% of the world's energy demand. There are about 439 nuclear reactors in 31 countries. About 70 new reactors are under construction in 2015, most of them in countries which are growing quickly. All in all, 160 new reactors are planned worldwide. Most nuclear reactors were built more than 25 years ago with pretty old technology. More than 80% are various types of light water reactor. Today, many countries are faced with a choice. The expensive replacement of the aging reactors, possibly with more efficient but less tested models, or a move away from nuclear power towards newer or older technology with different cost and environmental impacts. So, should we use nuclear energy? The pro and contra arguments will be presented here next week. Subscribe, and then you won't miss it. Our channel has a new sponsor, Audible. Okay. So <clears throat> we'll go ahead and take a look at those videos here in a little bit. So again, let's go over the typical nuclear fission reactor. This is the light water reactor that they were talking about here. Um, when you go ahead and start looking at this, you're using water as a coolant, as a um, source to go ahead and contain the chemical reaction that's happening in terms of the chain reaction. Um, and if you go look at chapter 12, 
5.1 in your textbook, uh, you can go ahead and learn more about how this works. Okay. The other piece that we need to talk a little bit about is, okay, so there's a reactor that melts down. Okay. What does that mean? What is the fallout? Uh, the most famous of these probably is going to be the Chernobyl incident. Okay. This took place uh, just outside of Pripyat, uh, and in, this is in the Ukraine. Now, this picture is actually taken from Pripyat Hospital. The gas mask you see on this individual is actually more of a prop than actually useful. Um, but this is now more of a tourist site than anything else. Uh, the, almost the entire population pulled out and really nobody actually lives there. They just do tours in because the levels of radiation are still considered uh, too high. They're unsafe, okay? And what you're seeing in the bottom left is an interesting quote that is actually the motto for the city or the model for the hospital, which was the health of the people is the riches of the country. Interesting, considering that this is where you had your nuclear wealth down. So when you start thinking about this, I hope you will take a look. And this is a great picture that was taken from National Geographic, um, kind of demonstrating the potential fallout of a, a nuclear incident. Now, would you take the tour? Would you want to go to an area where they had a nuclear disaster? Um, the Chernobyl exclusion zone does allow you to do this. Um, it is open for day tours. Nobody's allowed to really stay there. But there are some people that live nearby that still went back to their homes and kind of ignoring the government mandate regarding not living in what's known as the exclusion zone. So where exactly is Chernobyl? So it's located okay, in the Ukraine on the border with Belarus. Yeah, you can see here in the map, and there is the exclusion zone, which is the closed zone where nobody is supposed to be. Uh, there's the permanent control zone, which is the area just outside of that. And then you have the periodic control zone and then zones of threat, but they're unnamed zones. They're, they're ones that aren't as heavily uh, monitored. Okay. So when we think about this, is this the most radioactive place on Earth? I thought it would be worth our time to go ahead and take a look at radioactivity and what the potential risks were. So let's look at the most radioactive places on Earth. Radiation is frightening. At least certain types of it are. I mean, my Geiger counter doesn't go off near my mobile phone or the Wi-Fi router or my microwave. That's because a Geiger counter only measures ionizing radiation. That is radiation with enough energy to rip electrons off atoms. And it's measured in units called sieverts. If you're exposed to more than two sieverts all at once, you'll probably die shortly after that. But we're exposed to low levels of ionizing radiation all the time. Bananas, for example, are rich in potassium, and some of that potassium is naturally radioactive. So when you eat a banana, you're actually exposed to about 0.1 microsieverts of radiation. That's one ten millionth of a sievert. Let's use a banana for scale of radiation doses. You know, since people eat bananas, we become radioactive too. So you're actually exposed to more radiation if you sleep next to someone than if you sleep alone. But I wouldn't worry about that, because that dose is insignificant compared to the natural background radiation of Earth. I mean, there's ionizing radiation coming out of the soil and the rocks and the air and even from space. The level of radiation here in Sydney is about 0.15 microsieverts per hour. And that's about average globally. The level's usually between 0.1 and 0.2 microsieverts per hour. But there are places with significantly higher levels. So who on Earth do you think receives the maximum dose of ionizing radiation? Let's answer that question by going to the most radioactive places on Earth. 
some places you'd expect to have high levels of radiation might surprise you. I'm in Hiroshima, and that is the Peace Dome. It was about 600 meters above that dome where the world's first nuclear bomb was detonated over a city. It was detonated there to have maximum destructive impact. But the level of radiation today, almost 70 years later, is only 0.3 microsieverts per hour. I'm about to get into uh, an elevator. We're going down the mine shaft. This is an old uh, uranium mine. This is the mine where uranium was discovered. It's also the place where Marie Curie obtained her raw material. 1.7 microsieverts per hour. It's about 10 times the natural background that you would have. Nowadays, most of the uranium has been removed. But in this wall, there's still a small piece. And you can see, under UV light, it fluoresces. Look at that. Fluorescent uranium ore. This is the lab of Marie Curie. She won two Nobel Prizes, one in physics and one in chemistry. And uh, she conducted a lot of her work here. And this is her office. She would have sat right there. Apparently there are only a few parts of this area which are still radioactive. One is this doorknob. Well, it climbs not, not much, but... But that's like 10 times the background? Yes. More than 10. And another is the back of her chair. You can still detect alpha particles coming off this spot right here. Apparently after she was working in the lab, she would come, open the door, leaving traces of radium here, and then go and pull out her chair. Welcome to New Mexico. This is the Trinity bomb test site where the world's first nuclear bomb was set off. Right here, right in this spot. This whole area was vaporized. In fact, there was so much heat liberated by that bomb that it fused all of the desert sand into this green glass. And you can still find it here. They've actually named this mineral after the test. It's called Trinitite. Yeah, this is the only place on Earth that this has ever been made. The level of radiation here is about 0.8 microsieverts an hour. The trinitite itself is a little bit more radioactive. I've uh, got readings of two or three microsieverts an hour off them. Now, which place has higher levels of radiation than anywhere we've seen so far? The answer is an airplane. You know, as you gain altitude, there's less atmosphere above you to shield you from cosmic rays. So the level of radiation inside the plane can go up to 0.5 microsieverts per hour at 18,000 feet, up to one microsievert per hour at 23,000 feet, over two microsieverts per hour at 33,000 feet, and over three microsieverts per hour at even higher altitudes and towards the poles. That is Chernobyl nuclear reactor number four. It melted down on April 26, 1986. So what happened was so much heat was generated inside that reactor that it basically blew the top off, spreading radioactive isotopes throughout this whole surrounding area and over into Europe. And that is why we can still detect the contamination here today. Now right now it's reading around five microsieverts an hour. If I stayed here for one hour, my body would receive a similar dose to what you'd receive when you get a dental x-ray. So this is not a huge amount of radiation. And one of the reasons why the radiation level is not too high is because they actually removed a couple meters worth of topsoil from this whole area, and then they dumped it somewhere. That's why we can stand here. We're uh, driving into the Fukushima exclusion zone now. I'm just watching as the levels on my Geiger counter go up as we approach the zone. See those black bags at the side of the road? The Japanese are doing now exactly what the people in Chernobyl did, collecting up meters and meters of topsoil.
the mask is probably overkill. It's just to stop radioactive dust from getting into my lungs. This is definitely one of the most radioactive places where I've been. Even though the release of radioactive material was less than Chernobyl, only about 10%. Because it's much fresher, only three years since the accident, much less of it has decayed. So I've been getting readings up around five to 10 microsieverts an hour. And uh, I think we won't be staying here for too long because of that. I'm about to go into the hospital at Pripyat. And this is where the firemen were taken after they fought the fires at the Chernobyl reactor. And in the basement of this building, they have left all of the firemen's clothing once they realized it was so contaminated, they chucked it down there. impact than almost any other expel in some of the videos before. Nuclear power, you can see it in Russia there, uh, generate a huge percentage. Okay. And uh, if taken care of and kept healthy and in good shape, low cost, as long as we keep it safe. And there are wastes to deal with when we start dealing with this as well. Now, in the United States, part of our electricity is generated from nuclear power in the Northeast. So that's where most of our nuclear power plants are. Uh, compared to less than one-tenth in the Western United States. And part of that is because we have other sources. In Oregon, we have so many rivers, and we've tied our futures into hydroelectric power. Um, but depending on where, what state you're in, what part of the U.S. you use, the resources you have available. And so most of the sites that you're looking at here are going to be back east. You can see there is one there at Oregon, but it is closed okay, as of uh, 2012 at least. And so we can start thinking about how many of these we have, what happens to those power plants when they're done? What happens to the waste produced by these particular power plants? Now, there are advantages to this. And the biggest one is that it, it emits about one sixth as much CO2 as coal. So it is a lot cleaner. It does not emit air pollutants if the plant is operating within normal limits. And there is a very low risk of accidents in modern nuclear plants. Okay, if an accident still happens, it's bad, but the risk of an accident occurring is actually pretty low. What are the biggest challenges? Well, the biggest one is what do we do with the waste? Radioactive waste is highly lethal to humans and it's not possible to burn or chemically treat such waste to make it safe for human exposure. So what do we do? We tend to enclose it and try and put it somewhere where people aren't going to be around. So it must remain isolated from human contact for thousands of years to become less radioactive. And security can be a problem when we start looking at that because we don't want anybody to have access to that radioactive material. Uranium is a non-renewable source. It is not something easily produced and we have a fixed amount of uranium on our planet. Okay. The proven reserves that we have for uranium are projected to last for about 124 years at our current consumption rate. And that may seem like a lot, but when you start realizing that humans on average are living at about 80 years, that's really only two generations before we kind of use up the readily available uranium. Now, the reason we can get the cost down so low is as long as the power plant continues producing over long periods of time. Initial construction of nuclear power plants do have a high price tag. And this is one of the reasons, if you remember, that we ended up going with the light water reactor is that of the options that were available, it wasn't the safest, it wasn't the most efficient, but it was one of the cheapest. Okay. And complexities of safe transport and storage of radioactive waste are also difficult and expensive to deal with. And then what do you do when the plant doesn't work anymore? 
Uh, the average age of nuclear power plants in the United States is about 34 years. So do you decommission them, shut them down? Or do you try and, you know, overhaul them and remake them so that they're safer and more efficient? Okay. So now let's return to the In a Nutshell videos and take a look at the pros and cons of nuclear energy. Now I'm going to go ahead and start with the cons so that we can finish on a more positive note. But let's look at the downsides of nuclear energy. Three reasons why we should stop using nuclear energy. One, nuclear weapons proliferation. Nuclear technology made a violent entrance onto the world stage. Just one year after the world's first ever nuclear test explosion in 1944, two large cities were destroyed by just two single bombs. After that, reactor technology slowly evolved as a means of generating electricity, but it's always been intimately connected with nuclear weapons technology. It's nearly impossible to develop nuclear weapons without access to reactor technology. In fact, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty serves the purpose of spreading nuclear reactor technology without spreading nuclear weapons with limited success. In 40 years, five countries have developed their own weapons with the help of reactor technology. The fact of the matter is that it can be very hard to distinguish a covert nuclear weapons program from the peaceful use of nuclear energy. In the 1970s, the big nuclear powers were happily selling peaceful technology to smaller countries, which then developed weapons of their own. The road to deadly nuclear weapons is always paved with peaceful reactors. 2. Nuclear Waste and Pollution Spent nuclear fuel is not only radioactive, but also contains extremely poisonous chemical elements like plutonium. It loses its harmfulness only slowly over several tens of thousands of years. And there is also a process called reprocessing, which means the extraction of plutonium from spent nuclear fuel. It can be used for two purposes, to build nuclear weapons or to use it as new fuel. But hardly any of it is used as fuel because we don't have the right kind of reactors for that. A milligram will kill you, a few kilograms make an atomic bomb, and even an inconspicuous country like Germany literally has tons of the stuff just lying around because reprocessing sounded like a good idea decades ago. And where will all the waste go? After dumping it into the ocean was forbidden, we've tried to bury it, but we can't find a place where it will definitely stay secure for tens of thousands of years. Over 30 countries operate nearly 400 reactors, managing several hundred thousands of tons of nuclear waste, and only one is currently serious about opening a permanent civilian waste storage, tiny Finland. 3. Accidents and Disasters over 60 years of nuclear power usage, there have been seven major accidents in reactors or facilities dealing with nuclear waste. Three of those were mostly contained, but four of them released significant amounts of radioactivity into the environment. In 1957, 1987 and 2011, large areas of land in Russia, Ukraine and Japan were rendered unfit for human habitation for decades to come. The number of deaths is highly disputed, but probably lies in the thousands. These disasters happened with nuclear reactors of very different types, in very different countries, and several decades apart. Looking at the numbers, we may as well ask ourselves, are 10% of the world's energy supply worth a devastating disaster every 30 years? Would 30% be worth another Fukushima or Chernobyl somewhere on Earth every 10 years? What area would have to be contaminated so we say no more? Where is the line? So, should we use nuclear energy? The risks may outweigh the benefits, and maybe we should stop looking into this direction and drop this technology for good. If you want to hear the other side of the argument, or a short introduction to nuclear energy, click here. Our channel has a... Okay, so those are the downsides. So if we're going to do three downsides, let's do three upsides to go ahead and kind of finish up before we look a little bit more at uh, some of the other disasters. We've already talked about Chernobyl, but we should definitely take a look at Fukushima Daiichi as well. So let's start by looking at the uptakes or upsides of nuclear energy. Three reasons why we should continue using nuclear energy. One, nuclear energy saves lives. In 2013, a study conducted by NASA found that nuclear energy has prevented around 1.8 million deaths. Even if you include the death tolls from Chernobyl and Fukushima, nuclear energy ranks last in death per energy unit produced. 
While nuclear waste is really toxic, it's usually stored somewhere, while the toxic byproducts of fossil fuels are pumped into the air we breathe every day. So, just by reducing the amount of fossil fuels burned, countless cases of cancer or lung disease and accidents in coal mines have been avoided. If we can choose between lots of dangerous stuff being put into a deep hole and lots and lots and lots of dangerous stuff being pumped into the atmosphere, the former seems more logical. Nuclear energy feels way more dangerous though. Single catastrophic events burn into our memory while coal and oil kill silently. It's like the death rate of flying versus driving. Even in the best case scenario, it would take at least 40 years to switch to 100% renewable energy. So for as long as we continue using fossil fuels, nuclear energy will save way more lives than it destroys. 2. Nuclear energy reduces CO2 emissions. Nuclear energy is arguably way less harmful to the environment in terms of climate change than fossil fuels, our main source of energy. Since 1976, about 64 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions have not been pumped out thanks to nuclear energy. And by the mid-21st century, that could amount to an additional 80 to 240 gigatons. Humanity's energy consumption is rising steadily. According to US government projections, China alone will add the equivalent of a new 600 megawatt coal plant every 10 days for the next 10 years. China already burns 4 billion tons of coal each year. Coal is cheap, relatively abundant and easy to get to. So it's not likely that humanity will stop using it soon. Nuclear energy might be the only way of dampening the effects of climate change and preventing a catastrophic man-made global warming. Compared to the other things we do, nuclear energy is relatively clean. So even if it is a good idea to quit nuclear energy long term, it might be a good solution for the next 100 years or so compared to the alternatives. 3. New Technologies Maybe technology will solve the problem of nuclear waste and dangerous power plants. The nuclear reactors we've used so far are mostly outdated technology because nuclear innovation stopped in the 1970s. There are models like the thorium reactor that could solve the problem altogether. Thorium is abundant, really hard to turn into nuclear weapons and up to two orders of magnitude less wasteful than current nuclear reactors. The waste material might also be only dangerous for a few hundred years in contrast to a couple of thousand years. One ton of thorium is estimated to provide the same amount of energy as 200 tons of uranium or 3.5 million tons of coal. So while we cannot know for sure if alternative nuclear technology will keep its promises, shouldn't we at least do more research before we forego an opportunity to solve lots of humanity's current problems? It might not be an easy challenge, but that hasn't stopped us before. So, should we use nuclear energy? There are risks involved in any great human endeavor, and we have to make an informed decision rather than rely on gut feeling. If you want to hear the other side of the argument, or a short introduction to nuclear energy, click here. Okay, so there are pros and there are cons. And you're going to have to decide whether you think it's worth it or not. But what we're currently doing obviously isn't working with respect to our planet's overall health. And the longer we continue to do it, the more that's going to be problematic. But you cannot overlook the disasters that do happen even as rare as they are. And the most recent large scale of these is the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. Uh, due to years of poor regulation and inadequate safety controls, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant was completely unprepared when an earthquake and resulting tsunami hit the power plant in March of 2011. The disaster was the most severe nuclear accident since April 26, 1986, which was Chernobyl. So what happened? Um, the earthquake hit, followed by the tsunami, and the electric supply of the reactor's vital cooling systems failed. The tsunami wave then came in and destroyed the emergency backup generators, and there were lots of problems in terms of containment with respect to nuclear power. So. Reactor one had a meltdown approximately five hours after the tsunami and an explosion completely ripped off the roof. And this was on March 12th. Reactor two then had a meltdown on March 14th and an explosion on the 15th. Reactor three then had a meltdown on 14th as well. 
and an explosion completely destroyed the building that day. And then reactor four caught on fire from the explosion of reactor three and fire damage caused more further leaking of nuclear waste uh, and radioactivity on the 15th and 16th of March. So we've got Three Mile Island, we've got Chernobyl, we've got Fukushima Daiichi, three major disasters. Um, you should probably know. It's worthwhile to go ahead and show you some of the footage so that you can see the actual reactor exploding. This is only one of them, but I wanted to give you a taste of it so you could watch carefully. There you go, just off to the right there. Okay. And you kind of see a little cloud. It's not a full mushroom cloud like you see in nuclear reactions in the movies, but you've got some of that same basic structure. Here's zoom in to show it to you again. Okay. So that's bad because now we're putting all of that radioactive material into the atmosphere. Winds carry it, it's gonna drift, cover large areas. And so this is dangerous when we start thinking about the fallout. The 2011 accident at Fukushima was a wake up call, reminding the world of the vulnerability of nuclear power plants to natural disaster, such as earthquakes and floods. And remember, we have this aging group in the United States, they're over 30 years old for our, uh, the average age of our nuclear power plants. However, nature is not the only potential threat to our nuclear facilities. They are also inviting targets for sabotage and terrorist attacks. And in the world we live in today, that's a very real threat. A successful attack on a nuclear plant could have devastating consequences, killing, sickening, or displacing large numbers of residents in the areas surrounding the plant. And this could cause extensive long-term environmental damage. Think about those plastic bags we saw at the Fukushima Daiichi in the video we watched before. Okay, same sort of thing was done at Chernobyl. They're trying to clean up all of the contaminated topsoil, which you really shouldn't be growing food in. But there is hope. And I wanted to kind of leave you guys today um, by taking a look at life inside the exclusion zone. It has been 30 years since the world's worst nuclear accident, but we're still not really clear how badly the local wildlife has been affected by the radiation. Okay, We know that one to two years after the accident, populations of wild animals began to recover. But there are measurable genetic consequences of the exposure to low dose radiation as it continues. So we'll finish with this video and then we'll call it. At the fair, every ride is a ghost train. Now the loudest voices in Pripyat are the cuckoos. In the physics classroom, time is out of the equation. This was a showcase nuclear city for elite scientists and engineers. Now all that's left is a vision of what the world might look like if all the people suddenly disappeared. It sits just two miles from the Chernobyl reactor complex. On April 26, 1986, it blew up and caught fire. The unlucky few who dealt with the worst of the cleanup died from radiation sickness. Everyone else in the vicinity was evacuated to escape the worst of the fallout. There remains a 1,000 square mile exclusion zone all around the plant. But while it may now be one of the loneliest places on Earth, it's far from empty. There can't be a more powerful symbol of the risks of radiation than the city of Pripyat. 50,000 people used to live here, but come back nearly 30 years after they were all evacuated. And what strikes you is that it's an equally powerful symbol of our influence over nature. Because if you take humans out of the equation, the wildlife surges back despite the contamination. We're here to go on a fallout field trip into one of the most radioactive areas of the zone. 30 years on, there's no need for gloves and masks, but the boiler suits prevent us carrying contaminated dust and soil home. Ecologist Mike Wood leads the project. So this is the village of Buryakovka, and it's a village that sits right on the Western Trace. 
And the western trace so was part of the plume of that's fallout that came from the initial explosion of the plant. Yeah, that's the narrow plume that extends off to the west. And at this particular location, the level of contamination was such that some of the buildings were deliberately demolished and they started clean-up activities. Their guide is a Ukrainian scientist who knows more about the wildlife here than perhaps anyone else. He's pioneered the use of camera traps to study ecology in this forbidden zone. But before they switch on the equipment, there's three decades worth of weeding to get on with. There's a popular conception that radioactive fallout from Chernobyl somehow devastated the natural environment here. But when you come to the zone, you realise that's anything but the case. And what these scientists are trying to figure out is just how wildlife manages with that radioactivity. And also to study its return to what used to be a human environment. And take a look at what they've found. Over the last year, their camera traps have caught the return of European bison, as heavy as a car and absent for centuries. Wolves, never seen here before the accident, that have slowly migrated in from neighbouring Belarus. Wild Chevalsky's horses are thriving, along with wild boar and Europe's largest cat, the lynx. And then, last winter, an incredible discovery a brown bear, the first ever recorded in eastern Ukraine. Do you say this looks like a healthier ecosystem than areas outside the zone in Ukraine? Absolutely, absolutely much more healthy. Because for, uh, since uh, for wildlife, more important, absence of people, absence of their activity. But they need more evidence. They're putting camera traps in areas of the zone that receive varying levels of fallout. And they're not just looking, but listening. <laughs> what we've got here is a wildlife acoustic recorder. Okay. So this is going to capture the soundscape of the area that we're in. It's going to capture the noises from the invertebrates, the flies that are buzzing around. It'll capture the sound of the birds singing. It'll capture noises of large mammals that are coming through this area. Right. And it will give us a, a picture, a sound picture, mm -hmm. of the biodiversity that's present within the area. It's much needed research. Some previous studies claim to have found serious impacts of radioactivity. But so far, this team's work has found little effect outside the most contaminated areas. The studies are, are quite confused as to whether or not that's the case. So actually our study here in Chernobyl, it's, it's about trying to understand more about the way in which the animals in Chernobyl are faring. If that's showing no real significant change at a population level, then perhaps we then need to start rethinking our assessment of exactly what level could be described as safe. And even in highly contaminated animals, there's scientific debate about what the harmful effects of radiation really are. I'm standing now above the cooling ponds of the old reactors. Take a look at these fish. These Wells catfish have grown up to eight feet long. They've been described as radioactive mutants. And it's true, studies have shown damage to their DNA from radioactive mud in which they feed. But by every other measure, they are healthy and numerous. The truth is, they're this big because they like bread from visitors and no one is allowed to catch them. It makes it hard now to imagine the disaster in this reactor released 400 times the amount of radioactivity as the Hiroshima bomb. This long after the disaster, most areas of the exclusion zone aren't actually that radioactive anymore, but because of the way the fallout fell immediately after the explosion, some areas are still really very radioactive. This is about 1,500 times normal background radiation. It's not harmful in small doses, but you wouldn't want to spend too long here at all. But it's all relative. The radiation dose we received during our entire trip to the zone was similar to what you'd get from a single transatlantic flight. Maria Shovkuta has as much respect for radiation as she does for the authorities. She tells us how she sent them packing more than once. Ordered to leave in 1986, she came back a year later to live in the house in which she was born. She's 87 tomorrow. The levels they found weren't high, 
and this is the garden she's fed herself from every day. Her only real complaint is the lack of rain and the potato beetles eating their way through her spot. Thank you very much for joining us. Maria waits us off, and we leave her to get back to one of the quietest nights in the world. Then it's back along the decaying roads and into the bush to check the camera traps. In the thick vegetation of summer, we fail to spot any large animals, but they're certainly here. The shots are very nice, but just as animals, the team are here to study. Look at them, look at them, they move. What a fantastic shot. Joel was a human disaster in every sense. They cost lives, hundreds of billions of dollars, but the picture of fear follows me to practice this day. But another part of his legacy is now emerging. The mess of hard-packed humans, negation of the hand. It's so, there are a few places in the world, but it's getting wider. Hold on, travel news, digital. Oh, it is possible to come back. The decision to take the steps necessary. We can go ahead and leave a place better. And it seems wonder if something similar to this is actually the, all right, guys, that's what I've got for you. Stay healthy.